Let's turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. We are continuing to take uh, lessons from this wonderful book. We come to a very important section here today of Paul's farewell address to the elders of the church at Ephesus. Paul had a very close relationship with the brothers and sisters of Ephesus. You know, he stayed there for three years, which was a long time for Paul. And the church and Paul, they went through a lot of things together during that time, both good and bad. You know, they uh, evangelized all of Asia from Ephesus. It was a really a great thing. And, you know, working together with the Lord and, and, and letting him use you to accomplish things like this, it draws people together. And they went through some really hard things, too. Uh, like the plots of the unbelieving Jews and, and a riot that you can read about in Acts chapter 19 that was started by the unbelieving Gentiles. And when you go through things like this, whether good or bad, you get very close to people. And you can see the closeness of Paul and these elders all through this passage. But Paul uh, had left Ephesus and he was evangelizing And he's in a hurry to get back to Jerusalem. And so as he's coming back, he doesn't stop at Ephesus, but he stops at Miletus, which was about um, 90 miles, about 30 miles, sorry, south of Ephesus, probably a day and a half journey over land. And he calls the elders from the Ephesian church to come down to Miletus to meet him there because he really needs to see them and explain some very very important things to these elders. And it's a very emotional meeting. And amid many tears and, and, and much weeping, he tells them that he knows he'll never see them again. He tells them that the Holy Spirit has made it clear that he's going to Jerusalem and he's going to face chains and all kinds of affliction. And he says, I'll never see you again. And it's very emotional. It's a very, a very hard thing, a very bittersweet moment. But you can clearly see the bond between these men. The love between these men was so strong. And Paul had to just speak to him one more time to let him know some things that they really, really needed to know. And so Paul uh, begins to explain his own mission that he had in Ephesus and and reminding the elders of the way in which that he served the Lord. And I think that Paul is doing that because he's he's setting forth for the elders and and saying to them, this is how you should do it. Uh, Follow my example, follow my lead and how I served the church at Ephesus. And in as much as he was serving the Lord, he says, I want you to follow that example. He doesn't say it explicitly, but I think that's his goal. Be imitators of me, follow my lead, inasmuch as I followed the Lord Jesus and how I cared for the church. So let's uh, let's begin reading in uh, verse 17. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, and how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, 
saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. You see how Paul led the church in Ephesus. He led them with humility. He led them with tears. He led them through trials and not letting those trials derail the work that needed to be done for the Lord. And we see the mission of Paul here. Look at verse 20 again. What was the mission of Paul? The mission that he had in Ephesus was to not shrink from declaring the word of God. He says, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house. Things happened in Ephesus that would have made any, anybody feel afraid. And Paul felt afraid at times. In, in Corinth, if you go back to chapter 18 of Acts, he was afraid. And the Lord came to him and said, don't be afraid any longer. I have many people in this city. But we think of Paul as, at least I do, as sort of like uh, a Chuck Norris. You know, he's not afraid of anything. But Paul was afraid. And you see what happened in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. I encourage you to go back and look at that. The whole, the whole city got stirred up. Uh, this man came saying that this Paul is, is teaching against the gods of this city and the goddesses. And it gets the whole city in an uproar and there's this riot that starts. And for two hours they are shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Over and over. And Paul wants to go in and address the crowd and the brethren won't, won't let him because they know he'll, they'll tear him limb from limb. And there's things like that that might cause somebody to, uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shrink back here a little bit. I'm maybe going to uh, not preach as hard as I might otherwise. But Paul determined to continue speaking the word of God. And he says, I declared it. Anything that was profitable to you, I, I declared it. I didn't hold anything back from the church. And the mission of Paul, look at verse 21, was to solemnly testify to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Solemnly testify. I think that's an important word, solemnly. The things Paul was declaring to the church and to the unbelievers, they, they're not light matters. Uh, there are things in life that, that are solemn by their very nature, things of eternal consequence, and uh, they're solemn. And I think our world today has kind of lost that idea of that some things are, are solemn, some things are holy and need to be treated as such. Let's not make things seem light that are very solemn. And what was Paul solemnly testifying about? Well, he says repentance. We've seen this many times in Acts. Uh, the, the teaching of the need to repent of our sins. It's a message that we need to share with people too. The message of repentance. All of us have sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And we understand that, but we need to tell people that as well, that what, what is sin? What is the nature of sin? How, do, how does sin ruin people's lives? And, you know, sometimes people will shy away from that. It's not very popular to talk that way. It's not very, uh, it's just people shy away from that kind of talking about sin. But we need to tell people that, God is a holy God. God will one day deal with sin 
and we need to turn from our sins. There's judgment coming. So Paul was solemnly testifying about repentance. Look again at verse 21. He was solemnly testifying about faith in the Lord Jesus. Faith. This is the key to everything, isn't it? Faith in the Lord Jesus. Faith in what God has done. Faith in uh, what he has done through Jesus, through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That if they would believe in the Lord Jesus, and I'm talking about a, a true, a real, uh, a saving belief, faith, trust in Jesus, that, that they will be saved. And Paul says, I solemnly testified of these things. And, and it's faith in Jesus, of course, that leads to repentance. It's faith in Jesus that, that leads to confession of Christ as our Lord. It's, it's faith in Jesus that leads us to being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, as he commanded. And it's faith, of course, that leads us to, to living, to, to pursuing a life of obedience and holiness. Paul says, these are the things that I declared. And again, encouraging the elders of the church, these are the things you need to declare and testify about. Look down at verse 27 again. The mission of Paul was to declare the whole purpose of God. Sort of reiterating what we saw in verse 20. That he's not going to hold anything back. He's going to declare the whole purpose of God. So Paul says to them, I didn't leave anything out. I declared to you the whole purpose, the whole will, the whole counsel of God. You see, sometimes things are are hard to say because you know what kind of reaction you're going to get. So maybe there's a tendency to leave things out of the will of God, the word of God. But all of God's will must be taught. Even if it's not popular. Even if people aren't going to take it so well. Even if it's awkward or difficult to say, don't shrink back from declaring the whole will of God. And so this was Paul's mission, reminding the elders of this in Ephesus. <clears throat> but there were others who had their own mission. There were false teachers that were going to come in to Ephesus. And I think this is why it's so urgent for Paul that I need to meet with you men to talk about this. These false teachers were going to be on a mission of evil a mission of destruction of the church. And Paul has to warn the elders about this. Look at verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. Paul knows that once he leaves, there are going to be wolves that come into the church false teachers. So the church here is pictured as the flock of sheep and the false teachers are pictured as the wolves. Now what kind of picture does that paint for you? What are these wolves up to? Nothing good, right? They want to kill. They want to destroy the church. And it's very important to note that Paul says, these men will arise from your own selves. It's not an external threat. Although there was that as well. This is an internal threat. There are going to be men who arise from within the church who are really just wolves in sheep's clothing and they're out to destroy the flock of God. Be on the alert. Doesn't it make it all the more uh, insidious that these false teachers are coming from within the church? You let your guard down. 
But Paul is encouraging them to be watchful. So, so what is the mission of the false teachers? We talked about the mission of Paul. What was the mission of the false teachers? Number one, it was to destroy the flock. Look again at verse 29. Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. They, they don't care about the church's well-being. Uh, they, they don't care that they are destroying people. That's their intent, is to destroy. And they come in to pervert the truth. Look at verse 30. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things. They destroy people by perverting the truth. So God has set his standard. And that's what Paul taught. That's what we have recorded in the word of God. It's the standard, the truth. But there will be people who come along and twist it and distort it. They, they pervert it. And let me tell you, it's subtle and it's clever. Because nobody's going to come along and say to the church, I'm here to destroy you. You know, follow me. That's not how it works, is it? It's subtle, it's clever, it's, it's disguised, and it appeals to the fleshly desires of people. It appeals to the weaknesses that all of us have. And when you look in, in the rest of Scripture, you can start to see some of these teachings that got started in, in Asia Minor, where Ephesus was. You look at the book of Revelation, which we've been in lately, and the letters to the seven churches, and you, you start to see there was already false teaching popping up within the church. What kind of things were they teaching? Well, a lot of it was about loose morals and fleshly living and how, you know, you can kind of live how you want to live. Is that according to the teaching? And I'm sure it wasn't presented that simply, but it was subtle. It was crafty. Uh, you know, having no regard for holiness of living. That's the kind of thing you start to see creeping into the church. Uh, and they would, Peter says in Second Peter, these false teachers would promise people freedom. You know, if you would just throw off the shackles of, of this, these things that God has bound upon you, you could be free. You could truly live the good life. But Peter says, no, they've become slaves of corruption by promising freedom in this way. What were they teaching? Things like this. Did you know that your, your body, see, is separate from your soul? And so you can do things with your body and it, you know, sinful things and it not affect your, your soul and not affect your relationship with God. Or is that a perversion of the teaching? They would teach things like, um, you know, idol worship. How do you get members of the church to engage in idol worship? Well, it, it's just your civic duty. See, it doesn't have to mean anything. It's just your civic duty to put some incense on the altar and say, Caesar is Lord. Or, you know, you've got to work. You've got to support your family. And if you don't do that, then they're going to take your job, your livelihood away. So it's okay. You see, it, it preys upon people's weaknesses. It's subtle. It's tricky. And that's why Paul says to the elders, you've got to be on the alert. And look at verse 30. What is the mission of the false teachers? From among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. So instead of leading people to Jesus, the goal of the false teachers is to lead people toward themselves. And they'll draw the disciples away after themselves. So they, they, they might speak evil of the leaders in the church. They might uh, divide the church. They might cause factions in the church. All of this is, is designed to separate some of the flock away from the rest so that they'll be vulnerable. And the tactics, brothers and sisters, of the false teachers have not changed by and large. There are still false teachers today. And it's not that, not that we need to go around um, being very suspicious of one another and pointing fingers at each other because the truth is sometimes brethren are just mistaken about something. There's no ill intent. 
I'm sure I've been mistaken about things, though it wasn't my intent. Apollos in uh, Acts chapter 18 is a great example of this. He wasn't teaching the baptism of Christ. He was teaching the baptism of John, but, but no ill intent. He was just mistaken, and he was taken aside, and it, and it was explained to him more clearly. But there are people out there who do have bad intent, and they are trying to destroy the church, and that's who we're talking about here. False teachers today who pervert the truth. Teachers who deal very flippantly with the truth. That's a red flag, isn't it? People who are more concerned about entertaining the flock than bringing them the word of God. It's a red flag, isn't it? And they'll speak lightly of things like holiness or or they don't speak of it at all. And they try to gain a following for themselves and elevate themselves rather than elevating the Lord Jesus. It's, it's red flags that are, that are flying. It happens today. And so all of these things happened in Paul's time, and they happen today as well. And that's where the mission of the elders of the church comes into play. One of the missions of the elders of the church. Elders, also known as pastors of the church or shepherds of the church, overseers, or sometimes you'll hear bishops in our English translations. It's all referring to the same people. It's the elders of the local church. And so Paul gives them a mission. Look again at verse 28. First of all, he says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Be on guard. Be on guard for yourselves. Don't let yourself be pulled into these things. And then be on guard for the whole flock. That's one of the primary roles of elders, to watch for the wolves, to protect the flock. And then he says to these overseers, he tells them to shepherd the church of God. Just like out in the field, a shepherd would feed and water the sheep and nurture the sheep and lead the sheep in the direction of the Lord or in the direction they should go. So it is with the elders. They lead us in the direction that the Lord would want us to go. They, they help us. They nurture us. They feed us. And aren't you thankful for that? Shepherd the church of God. And and look down at verse 31. He tells them again, be on the alert. Remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Again, Paul is saying, remember my example. For three years, I admonished. That means to warn. I warned the brethren. Uh, and, and sometimes with tears I did this. And so what is he saying to the elders? That's what you need to do. Be with the flock. Be with them day and night. Admonish them. And that's not always easy to admonish people. You know, for the elders to come and say, you, you need to be careful about the way that you're going. Here's the Word of God. Look what it says. We just want you to be cautious. You're heading in the wrong direction. That's not a comfortable conversation, is it? But it needs to be done sometimes. They're not easy. They're not fun conversations. As Paul said, I did this with tears. So follow my example. Shepherd the flock of God. Admonish the flock of God. And so we've seen uh, encouragement for the elders. What about for the rest of us here today? What should our response be to all of this? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 says this. 
Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Let's help our elders to serve with joy. Let's submit to their leadership. Let's uh, hold them in high regard and be thankful for them. Not to put them on a pedestal. They'll be the first to tell you that they make mistakes too, like all of us. But to respect them, to thank them. Because I know these men, Bruce and Russ and Greg and Charles and Kurt, they, they do have your best interest at heart. They do want to help us as the flock here at Granville. They pray for you. They are humble servants of God, trying to do the work of the Lord. And they, they deal with so much that, that we don't always know about because it's sensitive situations, it's private situations, things that they deal with, things that keep them up at night that we may never know about. But they're shepherding the flock of God. Let's submit to them. Let's be thankful for them. And I want to encourage you too. There may be men here of the younger generations. We need to be looking ahead years down the road to prepare men to take on the role of a shepherd in the church. It's not something that happens overnight. It's something that happens with years of walking with the Lord uh, studying the Word of God in a very serious way, um, leading your family in the Lord. Uh, that's, that's very important. Um, and if you're, you're here today and you, and you think you may desire the work of an elder one day, that's a very good thing that you desire to do. Paul says that. It's a good thing to desire. And so I encourage you to start preparing yourself. Uh, and, and it's all the Lord's will. The, the, the shepherds are appointed by the Spirit of God, ultimately. But even if you're preparing yourself, realize you're, you're preparing yourself for wonderful things. And then perhaps the Lord would use you in this way to be an elder, to be a shepherd of the church of God. And so let us conclude Paul's uh, address to these elders. Look at verse 32. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and they began to weep aloud and embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they were accompanying him to the ship. Wonderful encouragement as he makes his way to the ship. Paul entrusts the elders to God's care and to the word of God, which he says is able to build you up. It's able to lead you to your inheritance. He encourages them to help the weak. He encourages them to keep giving of themselves because the Lord said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And he prayed with them and they wept. It's a, a heart-wrenching moment, but I know that the elders were built up and encouraged by this speech of Paul. And I know that the church was helped and built up. And my prayer and my hope is that you all have been built up as well this morning from reading these words, uh, powerful words. And I hope they've been an encouragement to you and to our elders. If you're here this morning and, and need prayers of the church, or if you want to learn more about making Christ your Lord and putting him on in baptism because you believe in him, 
and you're willing to repent of your sins, we would love to help you in any way that we can. <clears throat> Let's stand now together and sing. <clears throat>